Good morning. Welcome to the Leavenworth Church of Christ. We're so pleased you could come with us and be with us today. We have a beautiful day outside. Hopefully it doesn't get too hot, but we want to uh, gather together and get started with our worship this morning. Let's start with, Lord, we come before you now. If you're using a book, it will be not in page 455. Lord, we come before you now.
Good morning. Excuse me for being late. I have a little announcement before we have prayer today. John called me this morning. Our uh, brother Danny is missing. And uh, he's on medication. Uh, we called the police this morning. Uh, we went to his apartment. We could not find him. We uh, called several different friends or attempted to call. We just got back from the VA to see if he was there or possibly admitted he is not there. So we cannot find him. We are going to call the police and create a missing persons report is what we're going to do. So with that in mind, if you'll pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we approach your throne thanking you for the blessings you do to us. Our friendship and fellowship in Christ, Heavenly Father, is one of the greatest. This day, Heavenly Father, we approach your throne, bowing down to you, praying that you keep our brother Danny safe. Stay with him. Bring him back to us, Heavenly Father. Those that can help, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give them the strength and the knowledge to do so. In these things, Heavenly Father, we know that we can trust in your blessings. We know that we can trust in your knowledge and your foresight. Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with Danny and keep him safe, that we might find him safe and well. And Heavenly Father, we pray for him continuously. Heavenly Father, we have many on our prayer list, and we pray that you watch over them and take care of them, as we know that you do. We understand your blessings, Heavenly Father, and sometimes we do not foresee all the endings. But Heavenly Father, we trust in you to give us the strength of healing, the strength of that blessing to strengthen our spirit, our minds, Heavenly Father, and we pray that we continue to focus on you. This day, Heavenly Father, we come that we might worship you together as your body in Christ. And these things, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here on this first day of the week, the day that your son rose from the dead and gave us life everlasting. And in these things, Heavenly Father, you forgave us of all the sins that we have. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. This day, Heavenly Father, we look to your word, your songs, your prayers, the supplications and the thanksgivings that we can. And we continue to give you thanksgiving and all the things that you do for each one of us in our daily life. We thank you that we can come here, Heavenly Father, and look at your Lord's Supper, understanding the meaning of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, that your son went to that cross and gave up both body and blood and life that we might have eternal life through you. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for all the things, things you give to us, this place that we gather, this freedom that we have to share, and Heavenly Father, the friendships and the fellowship we share with each other that is here. Be with us this day. Be with all those who are here. We pray that you be with Brother George as he brings us a message that we know will be powerful and straight and true. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Song for the Lord's Supper will be Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Beneath the Cross of
Is there anyone who needs uh, a communion set? John does. Richard, if you would bring me one in my haste, I forgot to bring one up front. Thank you, brother. I have a reading from Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who, ha who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. <clears throat> These words of praise to God in the concept of forgiveness, healing. These are the examples that Jesus went to the cross for. The prophecies that talk about him, that he would take away the iniquities of all of us. He would heal us with his stripes. This is the reason we come this day. We know in the Gospels, and Matthew and Luke talks about them coming together on the first day, or the Passover. And with this, the Passover the unleavened bread, which you hold in your hand now. The unleavened bread was the symbol of yeast being removed from the household, as it was in the Old Testament. The idea that they removed deliberately, in our case, sins. And this is what Jesus did. And this was in the Passover he shared with his disciples. In these things, he gave his own body, the unleavened bread, and he did it so freely that he might fulfill all the things, the promises that his father had given to all the people, not just the Jews, but all the nations of the world, that he would come. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can come here, that we might have this memorial, this symbol that your son has given us. And that night which he took the bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples, take this, eat, all of you, for this is my body given for you. And Heavenly Father, we know that Jesus went through the scourging, the humiliation, the insults, but yet he carried the cross to Calvary, was hung between heaven and earth. These things, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We ask you to be with us as we partake of this as a group and fellowship in your body, your son's body, Heavenly Father. And we thank you that we can do this together pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 10 of Psalms 103, the verse reads, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. This is how God deals with us as Christians. And through his son, we are forgiven. And as we find in many of the epistles, we are in the righteousness of God because of what his son has done for us. Nothing of our own but through faith that we have in Christ. Let's pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this cup because we know that it was poured out on the cross by Jesus himself. Nothing that men could do, but Jesus willingly went there, and in doing so, he bled his lifeblood out that we might have forgiveness, the iniquities taken away, and the punishment removed. And in this fruit of the vine, Heavenly Father, we know that it's poured out for us, and it is bestowed upon us that we are white as snow, that we are white as wool through your son's sacrifice. 
And Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing. Be with us as we partake of this together in fellowship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a story in Luke. I will not read the entire thing. Jesus was invited by a Pharisee, a priest, to dine with him. And he entered into that room. While he was there, there was a woman who came forward. And weeping, she washed Jesus' feet. She put forward everything she had knowing that she was a sinner and she dedicated that to Jesus. In that sacrifice, that willingness to give, she did many things. She came into a house that she was not permitted. She humbled herself to give what she had and Jesus accepted it. We come at this time making offering back to the Lord as it was instructed to us on the first day of the week to come together to make preparations to give back that we might help others who need the gospel spread. Those who have need of not just gospel, but food and clothing and shelter, kindness and forgiveness. These are the things that we are to give. We do this in this place and it's time in the concept of we give back in a monetary form. But each one of us can give back as this woman did for Jesus to offer for that help. And of course, in that anointing at another time, the perfume, Jesus said it was preparation for his own death and burial. We should give on a level similar to that. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings you give to us that we might share with each other. You've given us the idea in the Gospels and in the book of Acts that those came together and they sold many things that those who had need would be taken care of. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that example that we can share with each other. And we know, Heavenly Father, we've come here this day prepared to give to you from the blessings that you've shared with us. We know and understand that we know nothing, that all things belong to you. You only give them to us, Heavenly Father, that we might be stewards of the things you've blessed us with that we might share and take care of each other. We pray all these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. chapter of the book of Romans. Romans 15 verses 1 through 7. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself but as it is written 
the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another, just as Christ who also received us to the glory of God. Good morning to everyone. We're going to give attention to the Word of God. In um, there's a lesson title that I've used for this morning's lesson taken from Romans 15, verse 4 in particular. And that verse again reads, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So things written for our learning. Of course, there are other resources that, that teach us as well. Things in nature. Um, but if I speak to experience, it is because of something, a particular verse that spoke to me in mounds, and I'm still meditating and receiving insights into one particular verse of scripture. So I'm not going to apologize for repeating this because it's necessary for our good that we learn to value the word of God in such a way that we continue to draw strength and encouragement from what God has already said. Proverbs 15, verse 31 says, The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. The ear, Ozen, that hears, Shema. Shema is, an, is, is a very ancient um, Jewish practice from Orthodox Judaism. The recitation of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, and you shall love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is, Shema is recited among Orthodox Jews three to five times every day. In fact, if you were to hear Shema quoted in Hebrew, you would understand the challenge that it presents to the Jew. Because hearing is not merely uh, intended to encompass the sound of the words, but the understanding of the words to be demonstrated in how we respond and react. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Elonai Echad our Lord is one. Our God is one. But what does the one God, the one Lord, require of us? You know, we learn things through life experiences as well as academic endeavors. Life teaches us something. And most recently for all of us, whether we were paying attention or not, because we're not completely through this pandemic, are we? But the pandemic has taught us some things, or at least brought things to bear, that even in the extreme 
um, experiences in life, it does not stop what God has commanded. What did we learn or what have we learned from the pandemic as it relates to our faith? One of the things that we learned is the importance of utilizing present day resources in, uh, to broadcast and make available the word of God to the sick and shut in. Those that are unable to assemble not as a substitute, but as a way to continue to encourage and to exhort so that when things are more relaxed, we can, those of us who are able, we can come together again in accordance with the scriptures. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And yes, there is a day approaching. There is a day coming. And we want to be prepared for that day. But we want to exhort and to encourage those like my wife. My wife asked me recently, Joe, how long have I been in bed? How long have I been in this condition? How long have I been disabled? And I told her it's been over 10 years. Sometimes we take our abilities for granted. My wife would love to be here, would love to be a part of this assembly, would love to be able to add her voice to those who are singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in her heart. I was getting ready for work this morning and my wife was singing in bed by herself. But it gladdened my heart. It gladdened my heart. At the mention of that, I want to read these words. And I'm going to preach some things this morning, but I want to start with the words of this song. This is a worship song, and I remember the first time I heard it, Justin Crossman was leading songs one day. And he taught us, at least myself, first time hearing this, was a song for worship, a song entitled Ancient Words. And the lyrics that I thought was so beautiful, so wonderfully expressed. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. O oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. We have come with open hearts. O oh, let the ancient words impart. Proverbs 15, verse 31. The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise. 
Reproof has to do with correction. How does life correct us? Through our experiences. When I meditate on Proverbs 15, 31, and I ask God to open the eyes of my understanding, give me insight into what the meaning of this is, that I might draw from it an understanding that would lead me into a deeper fellowship with God, a closer walk with the Lord. I want to understand how does life reprove us? It is through human experience. What have you gone through and what have you learned from what you've gone through, whether it be positive or negative, good or bad, what have you learned? And how do we demonstrate that we have learned from our experience? We are enlightened. We are enabled to make better choices and better decisions. We will not do the same thing over and over and over and expect a different result. We will look at the word of God and we will see examples of those who have believed God and heeded his counsel, followed his directions, respected his laws and his statutes, and his judgment. And we will conform unto that because what has been written is for our learning. How do we demonstrate that we've learned anything except we make better choices and better decisions? That we learn to conform unto the image of Christ, allowing God's word to permeate our hearts, to change our minds. It's not did, did not Paul say, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice? What does that look like in modern times, particularly today? What does it look like when a man presents himself as a living sacrifice unto God? Being not conformed unto this world, but being transformed by the renewing of the mind. Something has to take place where there's a change in a man. You know, we have made all kinds of mistakes in life in wrong terms. We found ourselves doing that which we would not do, like Paul said in Romans 7. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this bondage? But then comes the light and the realization of why God has spoken to us through the apostles and prophets. When Paul began in the 8th chapter of Romans, he says, There is therefore now, now, no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The things that we struggle with in life is because we're not seeking God. But our Lord said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And in fact, that's the very meaning contained in the word trust in uh, uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord. The word trust is translated from the Hebrew batak. Batak means to hide. High is an old English word spelled H-I-E. But the meaning of high is to turn quickly to. Turning quickly to God is contained in the idea of trusting God where God becomes our first recourse and not our last. So if we want to understand how this idea of presenting oneself as a living sacrifice, we see a person who has changed from walking after the flesh to walking after the spirit turning first to God and seeking God's counsel, God's way, understanding what thus saith the Lord and how that word would impact the, the decisions and choices that we have to make in our generation. Because what we do when, when we open up the word of God, we look and we see what Moses did, what Moses said, what Aaron did, what Aaron said, what, what Aaron's sons, Nadab and and, and, and Abihu, what they, what they said or what they did. You know, all those people are gone on to their reward. 
whether they were right or wrong, whether they trusted God, they've already gone. Their, their fate, as it were, is sealed. You know what's still up in the air? Is what we do today. Is what we believe today. That's what really matters. Because what we do will matter to the next generation. Almighty God said, I am the Lord. You shall have no other gods before me. He said, I am a jealous God. He demands complete devotion. He doesn't share his glory with anybody because there is none else. There is no other deliverer. There is no other healer. There is no other God of justice who will forgive us. God is our only hope. But he will show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. That's how we break the cycle of sin. Today, as much as ever, it is appropriate and it is imperative that we preach and teach the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, the latter part of that verse, Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel, the proclamation of the good news, because there's enough bad news circulating in our world. Our world is troubled and confused. Remember Paul's charge to Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. The perception that we have time to get right with God later is misleading. Let me repeat that. The perception that we have time to get right with God later is misleading. Tomorrow is not promised. Yesterday is gone. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. We have to, to learn from the things that are written. And we can also learn from the experiences of life. 
but how we demonstrate that we have learned and that we have received the message is that there is some action on our part to come toward God as opposed to standing still and doing nothing, making no improved choice or decision, or going even further away from God. The Lord said, my word does not go out and come back void, but it accomplishes that which he's directed it to do. God's word will show us how close we are or how distant we are from him. We have to take action. We have to make a choice in as much as even in the prophet uh, Joshua, uh, he said, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But he summed it up. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now those can't just be empty words. There's got to be actions that support the words in as much as James said, you show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. So what we believe ultimately will trickle down into our actions. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, read as follows. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What are the wages of sin? Death. Romans 6, 23. Separation from God. Who saves us from sin? We know the answer. We know the answer. Who saves us from sin? I want you to take a look at this. This is John chapter 8 and verse 24. John chapter 8 and verse 24. If you got a red letter edition, you're going to find these words in red. Who saves us from our sins? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus reconciles us with God. But here in John 8, 24, this is what, how Jesus is quoted. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Same chapter, verse 30 through 36. As he spake these words, many believed on him. As he spoke these words, many believed. And why did they believe? Because they didn't want to be dead in their sins. They didn't want to die and be separated from God. They knew that they were wrong. They made errors in their lives. And God help us. God correct us. God 
pardon us. God, be patient with us. God, give us what we need in order to make the necessary adjustments in life. That is my prayer whenever I open this book. I don't want to just read a bunch of words and say, man, that sounded good. And it has no resonance in my life. I can say that I'm a faithful husband to my wife who has disabilities. I have no, and she points it out, uh, you don't have the afflictions I got. No, I don't. But I got a determination that I will be your hands and your feet. I will do what you need done. I love you and more than when we walk down the aisle together. More. And I can't bear the idea of life without my spouse. I never knew it was possible to love a woman like that. But God says to the man, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Is the church perfect? Oh boy, all we got to do is look at ourselves. We know, <laughs> we know the answer to that one. But can you love your wife in, with her imperfections? Because that's how Christ loves you. We are clothed in his righteousness. He is patient with us. He's long-suffering. He cares for us. More than we could ever realize. When I pray, and it's not just a it's not just a saying, God's given us all that we need and more than we deserve in the person of Jesus Christ. It allows me to grow up and continue this journey of becoming more like Jesus. I want to make sure that I get all this in. Still in John 8, verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Romans, excuse me, John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Also read letters. Jesus saying here, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Today's news, the news stories of our present day vary, but every indication attests to the fact Americans are greatly divided and conflicted in the face of this divisiveness, this confusion and alarm are these sobering words of Jesus Christ. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The ear that hears the reproof of life 
abides among the wise. No matter how terrible our lives have been, if there is even a modicum of, of hope that would allow me to believe that somehow by some miraculous power, life can be better, the end can be better than the beginning, I want to embrace that hope and that expectation that God in his sovereignty can make all things work together for good, for my good, if I love him in accordance with his word. But if we sin, we have disconnected with God, and that disconnect is that we have been disobedient. Somewhere along the line, we have deviated from God, we failed to listen, to believe, to trust and obey God. So disobedience brings death. Obedience, life. But now we know that we're saved by grace through faith, right? But what that really means is that the debt that we owe, Jesus has paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it and made it whole. But shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we also should walk in newness of life. I want to say as emphatically as I can, there are many preachers and teachers of God's word that are not being fair to the people that need to hear and understand that when God commands something, he expects people to conform unto his commandment. For there are those who rejected John's baptism. And those same people, and I can, I, I can speak personally, because uh, some of you may not know that I was once an associate minister of the Church of God in Christ. One of the largest predominantly black churches in the United States of America. And the preachers would so, be so quick to tell folk, you can be a dry devil and go down into the water and come up a wet devil. Baptism does not save is what they would teach. But here's what they failed to tell folk. And I'm in Luke chapter 7 and I'll start at verse 28 which again is red letter indicating this is what Jesus said. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Now John had a reason that he went forth doing what he was doing. God commanded him to immerse in water. The Jews already had water purification uh, rites and rituals and methodologies For a Gentile to become a Jew, they would immerse him, according to the Jewish law, three times in water. 
Along comes John preaching the baptism of repentance and folk thinking, well, I've already been in the water. I don't need to get in the water again. Really? You remember Acts chapter 19, Paul going to Ephesus and finding certain disciples there and asking them if they had received the Holy Ghost since they believed. And then he wound up asking them, unto what then were you baptized? They say they were baptized with John's baptism. He said, John preached the baptism of repentance, saying to the people they should believe on him which would come after him. And guess who came after him? Jesus. So when they heard about Jesus, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. But those that rejected John's baptism, the Pharisees and lawyers, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Didn't matter that you had been in the water before. If God said, get in the water, get in the water. Now, let me make it very clear. There is no magical or mystical power in water to wash away sin. It is the commandment of God that stands between a lost soul and a saved. If God says, get in the water, get in the water. And guess who got in the water? Jesus of Nazareth. He had no sin. But he said, it is necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. It is necessary. And John baptized him. Now, if he didn't have any sins and he found it necessary, what do you think we should do? <laughs> we got all kinds of faults. I'm just trying to make it clear. We cannot play with God's word and manipulate it to say what we want it to say. Or even Peter said, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Not to putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can't make light of what God has said when God said, go you into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If God said it, our part is to believe it and to submit to it. Let's stop playing church. Let's be the church of God. Let's stop parsing words and let's speak as the oracles of God. Say what God said. It's his word and ain't ours. Let people understand what thus saith the Lord. Because it's time for us to demonstrate that we've learned something from what was written aforetime. It was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. All the years that I was with the church of God in Christ, they had in the church doctrine water baptism as an ordinance that showed people were already saved. Now, I have to tell you that the years that I was with that particular denomination, I saw no one baptized for any reason in water. And when I asked about it in a ministerial meeting, next thing I know, I'm, I'm being reprimanded publicly. And I knew then that I would have to leave that organization because I knew what Jesus said. I'd been reading and studying. I knew what Jesus said, and I heard what the preacher said, but I'll take the word of Christ over the preacher any day of the week. And I believe that that is the attitude that God wants us to have, that we, not meaning any ill will toward anyone else, I love the people that I was with, but I got to love God more. When I was a sinner, I was a faithful sinner. I was a strong-willed sinner. Why can't I be faithful to God and strong-willed as a believer now that I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb? It's time for us to be real. Demonstrate that we are learning. Learning enough 
to care about people and to be honest and to be truthful with them. We need to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith and we need to encourage others to contend for that same faith. There are differences among individuals. There are differences among assemblies. I have no problem with that. First Corinthians chapter 12 talks about, you know, the hand is not the foot and the, and the ear is not the eye and the nose and all that kind of stuff. There are many members, one body. We have to stop the kind of rhetoric that glorifies divisiveness in the house of God because God's house is not divided. It's not. If you got a problem, you better check yourself because what God does is add such as should be saved to the ecclesia that belongs to him. And what I know, and I can speak emphatically, because I still communicate with those who represent other congregations that don't have the name of Christ on it, they will, they will acknowledge that God has one church. And I challenge them to represent it in the way it is depicted in scripture and stop trying to make it something of man's creation because this is the house of God and we are members of it. If we believe and obey. Disobedience has resulted in man's suffering all sorts of adversities. Obedience leads to order, stability, unity, and peace, among other things. I'm going to bring this to a close by going to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'll begin reading with verse number 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them dil diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not. And wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Have we forgotten God 
in America. If we remember him, we will remember to trust and obey. And that would alleviate a lot of this foolishness, confusion, pandemonium, and whatnot that's going on today. With subjects like abortion, those that will power and they want power in government, those that war and fight and strive with one another, their churches in Ukraine, their churches in Russia. People still at odds because they're not remembering God. They're not doing the will of God. Somebody, if not everybody, is wrong but God. God is just and right in all that he does. Because if we just took the lid off abortion, I wouldn't be here today. My father was married. And I was the byproduct of his relation with another woman that was not his wife. I have a brother that has the same name that I have. My father's only child through that marriage was to a boy that was named after his father. And I was my father's first by my mother, and she named me after my father. So imagine that at a family reunion. Because my, my, ch my child's name is Joe George, too. And so is he is. I ain't jealous. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't aborted. But I'm glad that God has opened my eyes and given me an understanding of the truth. And he's opened ours as well. Verses 24 and 25 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And I'm reading that because of this. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, if they did the will of God, how might things in a societal uh, perspective go for them? It would have went well. And what about us? Same thing. If we remember God, if we obey God, things will be better for us than if we don't they will be better. Concluding with this, which we've already heard. In fact, let me go here and read this. I'm reading now Proverbs 15, verses 31 with 32. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise, he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. 
Proverbs 4, verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get an understanding. Understand what the Lord requires of us to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with our God. If you're here today and you have not put Christ on in baptism, I invite you to come. The water is ready. The angels in heaven stand ready to rejoice over every sinner that repents. Whatever your need, if it's for prayer, let your need be known as we together stand and sing the selected song of invitation. Would you live for Jesus and be honest, you are in topic that comes up and divides our country. Abortion is a polarizing subject. I have read many comments from passionate people. I applaud everyone for their commitment. However, I am not writing this to try to convince someone to accept my opinion. I am here asking you to take a bit of that passion to do something that definitely will make a difference in others' lives. There are currently 2.5 million homeless children, and another half a million in foster care in the U.S. alone. They are not there because of something they did, but they are right there right now. One thing for sure is these children are suffering no matter what your beliefs are or what comments you make. This need surrounds us. All I ask is you to take a small amount of your time and effort to do what I guarantee will make a difference in some child's life. Socks and underwear will make a difference in, uh, uh, to the homeless shelter. Food and comfort to make their life better, even a few minutes, even for a few minutes. Or make a larger commitment. Bring them to your home. Open your heart for a day or a month or the rest of your life. It is not an easy thing to do. It can, no, it will hurt. It will cost time. It'll cost money, but I believe it will make much more of an impact than rhetoric on a Facebook post. It will change lives. Thank you, Brother Joe, for those wonderful, encouraging words. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne thanking you for the blessings we have in Christ Jesus. Father, we have concerns on our minds about Danny. We would ask that you'd be with him and help him be found safe and healthy. Father, we ask for all those on our prayer list that are suffering illness, disabilities, 
that you would give them comfort and strength and to abide in your word. Father, now as we go forth from this place, let us do all things in accordance with Christ's word that he gave us through the apostles by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we might bring glory to your name and be obedient in all things. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.